I am excited about part two today with Mark Meckler. He's gonna tell us again about the convention of states. What is that? Well, it's a bunch of states in America coming together, and if they get enough signatures, they can restrain the federal government's power. This is Article 5 in the Constitution. He's gonna tell us about it. He's gonna tell us where he's at in that project. Also, I got a special guest on, John James. It was very shocking. He just producer surprises me and just throws him on set while we're in the middle of talking. He's going to join us. He played Hunter Biden's dad, Joe Biden, uh, and my son Hunter. Uh, the Breitbart movie that came out did very well. He's amazing in it. We're going to have a great conversation about cancel culture. And I kind of learned that this has been going on for about 40, 50 years in Hollywood. He's going to tell us about that. You're going to enjoy it. Please subscribe and like The Big Picture with Brett Craig. It would mean a ton to me. And now let's do part two. Don't forget to subscribe to The Big Picture with Brett Craig. I'll be right back. So where are we at? I mean, like I, I should have done the research and be able to tell you where you're at, but I thought you would tell me because you're going to know best. Like what, where are we at? Like what states are in, up for this and what states are not? And do we have any blue states? So when we started, I started this nine and a half years ago, uh, August of 2013, Basically, everybody told us this is just crazy. It's impossible. It's never been done in American history, yeah. this clause of Article 5. I like crazy and impossible. I thought you said, though, on your one interview that there has been conventions of states. In the there have been uh, conventions of states, but never under Article 5. Okay, never. Never to amend okay. the Constitution. Right. So states have gathered over 40 times in various okay. conventions to decide their borders, to decide how to govern the Colorado River. There's multiple yeah, states that sure. deal with that. The New York, New Jersey Transit Authority was decided in a convention how all of but that. never Article 5. Never, never Article come 5. to do that. Right. And so people said it was impossible. I just take that as a challenge. I like mm -hmm. that. Yeah. So today, 19 states have passed the resolution through both houses. So we're more than halfway there, significantly more than halfway okay. there. Uh, I think we have 15 states that will probably take it up this year. I expect this year we'll pass somewhere between four and seven more states. Uh, you know, just as we're recording this, uh, this last week, the Wyoming Senate passed it out of the Senate. So now we move wow. over to the House. A New Hampshire so committee passed it out. gaining momentum? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And it's like what's going on is the frustration is boiling up mm. and people are looking for the solution. People often look to D.C. and now they look to D.C. and say, we're not going to get a solution happen. from D.C. So what else is there? Yeah. Wow. So of the 19, any blue states? No blue states. And I think it's going to stay this way for a long time, maybe all the way through. And the reason is a difference between yeah. the left and the right. Yeah. Not a criticism, but just an observation. The left is very tribal. Uh, we see this with the cancellation, cancel right. culture, right? Yeah. So if you're on the left and you step out, you get canceled. So folks on the left step in favor of this, they're going to get canceled. That's not true on the right, by the way. And again, that's not a value judgment, just a yeah. different kind of culture. Uh, we see on the right, people are debating and yeah. yelling at each totally. other about stuff all the time. It doesn't mean I say, well, you're, you're no longer on the right side of the aisle. Right. It's like we, we disagree on some policy yeah. stuff. Yeah. That's not true on the left. So right now I would say... Uh, it's mostly on the right, but I'll give you an example of exceptions. Last year, we had two committee passages in Massachusetts, very blue state. That's from grassroots activists. We have a huge grassroots army, over 5 million people, building relationships with their legislators. We have Democrat sponsors in a variety of states. The majority is red, though. Yeah. I guess that leads me to like my, my, the skeptic Brett coming yeah. out a little bit. I love your enthusiasm for this. I think the idea is great. I mean, I, I, I think our founders were geniuses. Yeah. I think you're just triggering an idea that was lying. Yeah, not my well. idea for sure. Right. But it is absolutely the opposite, <laughs> I feel like, of what the left wants. Um, the, the very thing that they want is concentrated power. Absolutely. The ability to tell you what to do. Yes. And I just did a monologue on the bake my cake phenomenon, which is yep. you will bake my cake. Right. Oh, you will put on the cake and you will paint what I tell you to paint on your, that cake. Yes. You will do it and I will bankrupt you yes. if you don't. And so then you have this idea that, in, again, if we were in a common sense place, I think it would mean for blue states and for people of that persuasion, it would mean you get to be you and I get to be me. Now we can actually, you know, sit next to each other at that next Dallas Cowboy game and actually go, you know what, I can, I can do this. Yeah, we can cheer for the same team right. and have diverse ideologies. But the other side, I feel like right now, and that's, that's the, where my skeptic comes out, and I'm not trying to be skeptical in any way to kind of take, take you down. No, you shouldn't be skeptic. I but like just, skepticism. But yeah, I just slightly worry that, no, my goal is concentration of power. Right. 
I mean, at this point, and I look at the Democrat Party, you know, I see totalitarianism. Yes. I see Maoism. I, yes. You know, whatever you want to call it, it's, it's uh, we're going to take, we're going to go to D.C. and we're going to leverage the powers, all the full powers of, and the weaponization yes. of ABC agencies, and we are going to make you do I agree with our you. bidding. So you're right. trying to get them to sign up for giving back that power to the state. So I'm really not trying to get them. Okay. What I'm doing is working with the American people. I have no faith in American politicians, sure. generally speaking. Uh, and I say that with all due respect because I've met a lot of yeah. incredible people in state legislatures who I really do have a lot of respect for. But the American people get it. And so what you're talking about when you're saying they're Maoists and they're totalitarians, your average Democrat neighbor is not a Maoist or no. a totalitarian, right? And they're just as sick of what's going on in D.C. They have a different ideology than you, a different political orientation. And they don't hate you. They don't want to see the state yeah. weaponized against you. And so what I'm doing is going at the heart of what it means to be an American. And for most Americans, that means I'd rather be self-governing. You know, I have friends, a lot of friends still back in California, people in Marin, California, very liberal place, Berkeley, California, very liberal place. If you ask them the question, would you like to govern yourself or do you want Washington, D.C. to govern you? They'll say, we don't like Washington. We want to govern ourselves. So your feeling is, and I, I, mean, I think that's good that you said that, because I do think I am grouping and I'm forgetting that the leadership of a party is not necessarily the rank and file of a party. Right. This is the leadership of the military is not the rank and file. Exactly. Of the, military. the leadership of the FBI is not the rank and file of the FBI. So maybe I am kind of too much putting them all in one thing. So you think there's a, there's a considerable amount of people that would put a D in front of their name that would say... Yeah, I, I, could, I could see how this could help. So we, we actually know. I mean, we pulled this scientific polling, full-blown national poll, and what we wow. find is 75% of Republicans are in favor, about 66% of independents, and 52% of Democrats. Wow. Right, so it's pretty So high. you have the populist Absolutely. momentum. And if you say something like term limits, that number is 85%. If you say balanced budget, it's 85%. If you say the federal government's too big and it needs to be shrunk down to size, it's 72%. And so this crosses party lines. All these things that we're talking about, most people are like, yeah, we got to do those things. That's not working. Term limits, for instance, just real quickly on that yeah. one. Why would it, so I know why they don't want it in D.C., is that what it is? It's just I'm a, I'm a congressman or whoever it is. I don't want term limits. And the corporations and the lobbyists that are putting money into my campaign or whatever, they don't want term limits right. because they want the favor paid back. Correct. Is that how it stays? That's yeah. how it stays. That's the way they want it. And, in fact, it's been interesting. I thought going into state legislatures, which is primarily where I work, that state legislators would be pro-term limits because my pitch was yeah. – you want to go to D.C., we want people like you in D.C. ultimately. Move on. Yeah, so you can move on and move up. And they said, no, we don't like term limits. <laughs> and I think they all think they're going to go to D.C. They're going to be the one that's not going to be subject to term limits. And to be fair, in, in defense of no term limits, it takes time to learn that job yeah. and to learn I, where all the levers and buttons are. And so if you were to impose really short term limits, I think it would be difficult to have people, even who you and I might like, become effective in D.C., this is why our term limits resolution includes staffers and bureaucrats. If you don't limit them and you limit Congress critters, you'll just make the staffers and bureaucrats the ultimate power. And they kind of are the ultimate power already. So let's just talk about barriers to it then. I kind of brought up my skepticism, yep. but like what are the barriers then? I mean, who is standing in the way of a convention of states? It, to me, it seems obvious that we need to do something like this. I know there's some fears yep. that this thing could be used in the wrong way. What if they roll back the Second Amendment? You know, and you, you, you have an answer for that, which is, what is that again, real quickly? It's the fact that you- Well, it takes 38 states to ratify anything. And if you do the math, there are 25 states right now that have constitutional carry, no permit required. 24 states, you can carry your handgun in a state legislature. This sounds crazy, but there are 14 states where you could take a loaded AR, sling it across your back, and sit in the gallery and watch the proceedings. <laughs> okay, I'm not saying that's a good idea. Right. I'm not, I am not promoting that idea. <laughs> but people... <clears throat> I'm just saying that's legal in 14 state legislatures. So this fear of, like, things... I would just use Second Amendment as an example. Well, it's the one I hear the most. So it's, it's the, the irrational right. fear. It's of, like, we all get together, we're going to live. It takes 13 states to stop any amendment from being ratified. So you don't see... Because I think what people are saying is... The same side that would weaponize the FBI, the same side that would weaponize the IRS. Right. Why wouldn't they weaponize Article 5? Absolutely. That is what they're saying. And the answer is 
the founders were structure geniuses. They understood the structure of government. They created a bar so high that nobody can run away with this. Look, as a nice. very conservative Christian guy, yeah. we're not going to get the most conservative Christian things I would like because you're not going to get 38 states to ratify it. Yeah. There's too many states that are purple or fall in the middle or blue states. So this was designed 34 states to call and 38 states to ratify. It's the highest bar in the American system of governors. There's nothing else like it. If you've ever worked in a state legislature, you know getting a majority on anything is hard. Yeah. Getting a super majority is really hard and almost impossible. Now imagine we gotta get a super, super majority of all states to agree before you can get something to be an amendment. So it's a ridiculously high bar. And our founders, it seems to me, like they actually kind of wanted incrementalism, right? Yes. They didn't want, and this is just something, they didn't want the pendulum going like this. Absolutely. What we're doing right now is Obama, Donald Trump. Yes. You know what I mean? They Joe Biden. They did not. You know what I mean? Instead, it's like they want us, they want incrementalism, right? Like it's just, the pendulum's just doing this. Well, and this is why it is so difficult to call an Article 5 convention. This is why it's so difficult to amend the Constitution. They didn't want it to be a quick cultural shift. Amendments, the best way I can describe them is they're supposed to be cultural capstones. In other words, we've had the fight. We all agree on something. We've agreed for a long time. We've built that pillar of, of ideology. Now let's put a cap on it right. and say, okay, our constitution is now going to say this. A great example of this is if you look at the Civil War and the post-Civil War amendments, and people will say things like, well, the Civil War amendments ended slavery. No, they didn't. The Civil War ended slavery. Right? And then we decided as a country to put a capstone on it and to say, that chapter's closed, we're never revisiting that, here's the amendment that puts in that, that in place. So they're not intended to create societal change, they're intended to show we agree on something and we want that to be part of our fundamental governing document. That's cool, checking it out. So who's against it again? So um, let's go back to it, because I think I immediately I say blue states, but you say I think I've heard you say entrenched Republicans up in D.C., they're not big fans of this idea. I'll give you a couple of very specific examples. You know, sometimes when you look at politics, and again, I know you and I come from California, people think of California as just blue. Geographically, it's a red state, yeah. right? So if you live in California, grow up there like we did, you know a lot of folks that are very liberal and a lot of folks that are conservative, right? If you go to the fringes of either of those ideologies, it's like a circle <laughs> and they, the wingtips <laughs> touch, right? And so opposed to convention of states are what I would call radical right and radical left. And so I'll give you specific examples. Senator Russ Feingold, who is a former very liberal, I call him socialist yeah. senator from yeah. Wisconsin, about four months ago came out with a book opposed to our organization and this idea. Attacked me, attacked Rick Santorum, who works for us, former presidential candidate and senator and was honest in the book, it's actually a pretty good book, yeah. where he talks about the history of Article 5, what it's for, and then he says, but what these guys are doing, gutting the administrative state, making government smaller, taking power away from DC and giving it back to state, all horrible stuff. Every radical leftist organization in America has signed on to that position. They literally signed a press release five years ago against Convention of States. Okay. It was led by Common Cause, which is a Soros organization, uh, it was led by Planned Parent, La Raza, MoveOn.org, Daily Sierra Cause, Club, Sierra Club, League of Women Voters. Uh, all of these organizations signed on to this saying this is a terrible thing. Who supports it generally? Mark Levin, Rush Limbaugh had spoken out in support, God rest his soul, Sean Hannity, uh, Ben Shapiro. I mean, it's a who's who of conservatives in America, Governor Ron DeSantis, yeah. Yeah. Governor Abbott. So if you look at the divide, it's you got the radical left, the majority of the left, you got the conservative right is in support. And, and so that's where you find us generally. If you go all the way to the far edge of the right, there are some groups. Uh, one is called Eagle Forum. They've been opposed to it for many years. Another is the John Birch Society. Well, I was surprised because the other day, <clears throat> I, won't, I won't name the name, but I, yeah. I heard a pretty far right, I guess far right, or I don't know, yeah. far right. But yeah, like was spooked by this. Yes. <clears throat> and like wondered if it was wrong headed or misguided, right. uh, you, your name even came up. Um, and it wasn't mean, it right. wasn't like they weren't attacking you, they just, they had questions. They have fear, they were, I would say fear, fear around They had fear. That's the, that's the right description. So it's interesting, as conservatives, we should always know where our ideas come from. And that fear idea comes literally in the mid 70s, Roe versus Wade is 73, 
In the mid-70s, states are starting to pass applications, Article 5 applications, to overturn Roe versus Wade, to call a convention and propose an amendment to overturn it. Uh, and what happens is Phyllis Schlafly, who was the founder of Eagle Forum, great constitutionalist, yeah. great fighter for life, she's become friends with Chief Justice Warren Burger, who's now retired. He's the Chief Justice who signed Roe versus Wade. So this is the seminal decision of his entire career. And she asks him, what do you think about this idea of a convention? Well, what do you think he's going to say, <laughs> right? It's attacking the seminal case of his entire career. He says, it's a terrible idea. We could lose our beloved constitution in a runaway convention. And the left starts spreading this idea to the right. And I call it a mind virus. In fact, David Horowitz, the great documentarian of- We end up taking on their, their slogans. And Horowitz has written a whole piece saying, look, this is leftist propaganda intended to keep people on the right from using the Constitution to save the Constitution. So that's how this idea of a, what they call a runaway convention gets into some on the far right. Runaway convention and, is yeah, a fear word. Yeah, you'll hear that exact language used over and over by some people on the far right. So it's entrenched Washington that wouldn't want it, but you don't need them because my understanding is you've got to get state legislatures. Yeah, Washington. So that's why you feel like you have a good shot because yep. I've just got to get them. Yep. Um, I guess another barrier, like another one of my little skeptic things, um, I already mentioned that I don't feel like, I guess the, the radical left is not, not going to be interested because the, the nature of them is- I would say not only not interested, but I think it's fair to say they're going to go to war against it. Yeah, I mean, so they, they got to stop this. It's going to be a multi-billion dollar right. war against we want, this idea. Yeah, centralized government is our jam. Yeah. Like, we're not looking to, yeah. to break that monopoly up. Um, I guess uh, another one that came up to me was, and I, I started to talk to you about it the other day. To me, and I don't know, I think a lot of Americans are starting to feel like, I'm not even sure DC is controlling things. I'm starting to wonder about what's going on over in Europe. What's going on with the World Economic Forum? The example I'd give, Joe Biden runs for president. His slogan is the slogan Boris Johnson sang, <laughs> is the slogan that Jacinda yeah. Ardine is saying yeah. over in New Zealand. It was more Trudeau, build back better, build right. back better. Oh, you guys have all been meeting and now Joe, who I guess their campaign can't come up with a slogan, has now adopted your slogan. And that was just a sign to me. And then the lockstep policy worldwide on COVID. Yep. You guys are all talking there too. They've been talking about you'd the like great to, reset. Yeah, you'd like the great reset. You'd like to give all the power to the WHO to control right. pandemics in the future, right. vac vaccine passports. I guess another barrier to this to me, and maybe it doesn't matter because if it's happening in state legislatures, they can't stop it. But one of the barriers to me is that I'm not even sure if DC is that interested in the American people anymore. There's some agenda above them that is creating their taglines yeah. for their presidential campaigns. Do you see that, that NGO, World Economic Forum, the partnership with the big corporations, the Fortune 100, let's say, who have this outsized influence, they've all gone woke and gone signed up for ESG uh, and all this stuff. Do you see that as an impediment to this or because you're going through state legislatures, it doesn't really matter? Well, I think they'll attempt to impede it for sure. And so I think that is a significant barrier, right? When we don't pretend that it's not out there, we're not Pollyanna-ish, we know this yeah. is full-scale media warfare that's gonna go on. That's part of the reason we do things like this, right? Yeah. Because we need to let people know what's coming. I expect that, that full assault to come, but it's actually an advantage that we have. And the reason it's an advantage is because most people don't want that, and most people wanna fight back against it. And so if they look at DC and they say, well, I can't fight that in DC. They're all in on it. Mm -hmm. What do I do? And the answer is take the power away from DC and put it in your state. And by the way, it's not that the states aren't subject to this because they're subject right. to the same pressures. The issue in the states is you can actually fight more effectively in your state. You could literally pick up the phone today and make an appointment with your state representative or your state senator. Try to do that with your federal representative. And you'll get some 23-year-old legislative aide, right, who would be happy to talk to you, maybe, if you make a contribution. But in the states, you and I and the people have a lot of influence. This is one of the things that we're doing that's beyond Convention of States, is we're building up this army now, over five million people, who are engaged in politics in their states. They know how it works. They have relationships with their legislators. They know how to move legislation. They know how to engage in elections. A lot of them are running now. We had people from our organization elected all across the country from the school board on up into the state legislatures. So if you wanna transform the political system, the left and the powers that be, the statists want you to think you have to go to DC. Yeah. That's where all the smart, powerful people are. But the way to do it is to work locally and build your way up. And I think you just made a good case for the fact that the, the, the World Economic Forum, the UN, the SDGs, all, all that sustainable development stuff, 
<clears throat> they can't, they have a much easier time controlling a few entities. So if, if there's a lot of federal power and I control the federal power out of Washington, then it's easy to control. Absolutely. But if I got a bunch of states, I'm going to have trouble doing it's that. It's much more difficult. So you, that actually is very hopeful to me, what you just said, because I think so many people are feeling that right now. Like the, one of the biggest things I don't think Mitch McConnell or any of these guys and even the Republican Party are talking about is like there is an outsized control coming from global, global powers, I feel like the G20, whatever it is, yeah. they're, they're walking in lockstep and American people are sensing that we're not very high on the agenda. Some other agendas, but I think what you just said really is a way to, to uh, combat that. Your idea is, or founder's idea is brilliant. Um, so then I guess I would say then, like you actually, that gives me, even me more hope to, to be getting towards to this, towards the end of the interview, is that you're not black-pilled then. Because I think a lot of people are kind of black-pilled what I mean by black pill is there's the red pill, which wakes you up. Yeah. The black pill is it's over. But we're on the Titanic. We're re rearranging yeah. the deck. And I'll even yeah. hear some Christian pastors yeah. say this. I agree with that. And, agree with that. But you're not, that's not where you're at. No. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, it infuriates me when I hear the black pill crowd. And I've heard even uh, talking heads, public commentators, like it's over. It's too far gone. It's the World Economic Forum or whatever their reason for feeling black pilled pastors who say, well, it's the end time. Yeah. And my position on that, I mean, first of all, scripturally, I've yet to find the scripture that says, Jesus is coming, so sit on your backside. and Go to the monastery. Right. Yeah. You know. <laughs> that doesn't exist right. that I've found anywhere. I challenge anybody to show it to me. It says we're supposed to, we're supposed to take territory for Christ, That's always. Right. And it also says we have no idea when the end time is. So, yeah. like, why are we worried? I don't worry about that. No, I love what you just said, because we talked about this yesterday with one of my guests. We're supposed to be salt and light. How can you be salt and light if you're not in the culture? What was Jesus doing? He was in the culture. Absolutely. He was in the culture. He went everywhere the culture was. I show up in the middle of that. As in the darkest places. That's right? right. And so I also, I think I have a different perspective on America than a lot of people because I'm blessed to travel all the time and to meet regular people, right? To just hang out with folks yeah. in a cracker barrel somewhere in Tennessee, right? And, yeah. and I do this all the time, yeah. hundreds of times per year. And so what I see are great patriots, uh, people of faith and people not of faith, but people yeah. who believe deeply in what makes America great. And, and their belief is it's tied into the Declaration of Independence. It's tied into all the founding right. documents. It's tied into this history. Not that the country's perfect, not that the country ever has been or ever will be perfect, but we're based on these incredible eternal principles. And so I know personally that there are millions and millions of people, I would argue probably at least a couple hundred million people who still believe in those values. And the key is we need to focus on those people and help them rise up and restore the soul of the nation. So even with your Christian eschatology, and I don't know, you know, there's, we can get into eschatology and it's, it's pre-millennial, post-millennial, we can, Jesus returning, all these different ideas. You, yeah, you, you feel very optimistic that we have to be in the fight. Yeah. And that we don't get to get off the football field just because, you know, you think Jesus is coming back at some point and that attitude really bothers you. And Well, and especially among people who I would say are kind of talking head class yeah. uh, or politicians who say this. And I, I've heard quite a bit of it since the last election. You know, yeah. people expecting a red wave. They're super disappointed. They see the election fraud and, and they think, well, how can we ever win? And so they get very dark. I, I would like to remind people, first of all, if you're a person of faith, the enemy loves it when you get lost right. in the dark, right? That's what he wants. Yeah. He wants you to lose all hope. That's yeah. where he's got you, yep. right? And so one, don't do that because that's what the enemy wants of you. But I would also say for people who are in the public sphere, who do the, what we do, if we're going to be up here, we have an obligation, and our obligation is to lead people to the light, to whatever little bit of ability we have to do oh, that, yeah. right? It's not to get up here and say, well, you should all give up. Yeah. It's so dismal. Just hang out in church right. in your monastery and talk about how the ends Right. We're all so weak and <laughs> pathetic. We, look, from a, from a faith perspective, we're made, all of us, every one of us, in the image of God. So if we're made in the image of God, is that small and tiny and insignificant who aren't expected to accomplish anything? No, I actually think God has pretty high expectations for us. That's right. He expects us to take the Holy Spirit, the gifts that we're given, and do great things with yeah. that stuff. I think, I think we're made to be superheroes. Yeah. We're, we're not made to be small and insignificant. I love that. And then I also think, like, Mike Favaro is a pastor I really like. He says God loves to hit it out of the sand six inches deep. Yeah. And I'm like, then you look at the Bible and you go back and you go, yeah. 
when does God part the Red Sea? When Moses' back is against it. Absolutely. You know what I mean? And the Egyptian army is coming. It's like, it's, it's like this every time. I'm going to stack the odds so badly against <laughs> me that, that when I move, there's no other explanation. This and I'm going to pick weak people, absolutely. by the way. I'm going to pick, pick people that are not impressive. Gideon. Right. I love the Gideon story. Patty and I had a great name named Gideon because I always wanted to be reminded Gideon's an unlikely warrior. He's a coward by his own estimation. Yeah. He's hiding when the angel comes to him. He says, not me. It's got to be somebody else, right? He even challenges God a couple of times. Yeah. Like, you've got to prove you really mean Right, me. three times, I right. think. Right. And then cut the army so small, make his, his warrior so small that he can't win. It can't be him. And so God likes to show his glory through us. Right? We're just agents to demonstrate That's God's right. glory. It's not us. It's go- always God's glory. I love that. Because, I, yeah, I think about it, even little David. It's like yeah. that story is so amazing. You know, Samuel, the uh, prophet, shows up, and, and Jesse doesn't even bring David out. Right, because David just a can't guy. be the guy. Right. No way. He's going to be the next king, king of Israel. And it, no, 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 it's the little one. Right. It's the little one. And then it's the little one that's got the moxie. And got, I guess, the spirit inside of him to say, I'll take that giant on. Like, because I think because he knows God, right? He's anointed. He knows God. And when, he, when David comes out and takes the field of battle, he's looking at all these mighty wars. He's like, what's wrong with you guys? This guy is smearing your God. How can you allow that to happen? And actually, I think God's positioned him in a way. I love that story so much. He's not the underdog. Are you kidding? He's anointed. He's got a relationship with God. He's spent his entire youth practicing with a slingshot, which we now know by modern ballistics has the force at the distance that he was throwing it of a 38 caliber bullet out of a pistol, right? He, he can hit a lion on the run with a lamb in its mouth and knock down a lion. He's got this big old giant standing right. there like, ah, oh, come but, and get me. But to your point, what does he say? And I'm, I don't know the words exactly, but it's like today, like the God of Israel is going to... All glory to God. He doesn't say today because I'm so great and I'm a mighty and powerful warrior. Yeah. It's all for the glory of God. And I love that. I know. It's, that's a, such a great story. That, that's really encouraging because I think, and if I'm being honest, I think I have a tendency to get, go there sometimes. I think all yet, yet I'm sitting here with you and, and this, I would argue, is part of the, the push. Everybody doing a little bit to grab the line. And wherever they are, like, what are you doing to, to stand up to these things, whether it's women's sports being erased, the idea of a woman being right. erased. As fathers, what kind of cowards are we if we will not stand up in a board, uh, school board yeah. room? You know what I mean? I just, that's one of those issues. And I'm just saying, like, innocent people are being harmed now. Right. Little kids are being harmed now, like in that particular issue that Matt yeah. Walsh has taken on. And who are we? As, as Christians and as men, and even if you're not a Christian, if you will not protect your, your daughters, like yeah. to be able to go into a locker room, a bathroom, you know what I mean? The, the, and I, these are the kinds of things that are happening. We can't depart and like walk off the battlefield yeah. black-pilled because actually it's not even about us. It's right. actually about people. Innocent people are being hurt. Well, yeah. I think, you know, what you're doing here is such an important part of this. And, and you look at the set, the big picture. What's the big picture? To me, the big picture is from any individual, it's whatever you can do. That's the big picture. Mm-hmm. You know, God expects great deeds out of us. What's a great deed? It's whatever you can do. Sometimes the greatest deed is a glass of water to a thirsty man in the right moment. Right? Yeah. And so I think sometimes people, they might look at you on a set like this and I who, who have some reach and think, well, I, I can't do that, right? Yeah. Those guys are doing that. What can I do? And the answer is Absolutely something you can do right there in your own sphere. It's kind of the Nehemiah story. Yeah. Rebuild the wall right where, right, you, right are. where you are. Go to your school board meeting. Stand up for your kid who's getting shoved woke curriculum down his throat. Right. Those are big deals. They might seem small to you at the moment. They're not. They're, they're a piece of that bigger mosaic. But I would even say, you aren't sitting here, and I'm not sitting here because we decided to put a giant screen up today. You're sitting here, and you're where you're at with 19 states on this Article 5, and it starts way back when God put his hand on you, I think, yeah. and began to move you. And all you did, I mean, little by little, especially when you became a Christian, is just say, I'm just going to take a step of obedience. Right. You know what I mean? Like, the bit, I was saying yesterday, we can't see the big picture in our lives a lot of times. It's so big. God right. sees it end to end. Right? The, but what, what can I do? Well, I can take a step of obedience today. And I, that's why I love what you just said. Because I think we do look and we go, well, Mark Meckler, how am I going to do something like that? 
Well, Mark Meckler's journey begins in 2000, I guess, eight, and you yep. become a Christian, I don't know, when, what was the year again? 10 years ago, so that'd be- Yeah, 15. so 10 years ago, you're not here. It was the little steps of obedience, and now God, I think, and is rewarding that faithfulness with a platform. And um, so, yeah, I just think to me, that's, that's what it is. Like, I think we wake up and we say, what's the one thing that I know God's putting on my heart today that I need to start to do. So there's there's a something I would encourage folks to do, a little bit self-serving, but if you feel like you want to get involved and you don't know what to do, people can go to conventionofstates.com. Yeah. They can sign the petition if they support what we're doing. There's a take action tab. I think this is the most important thing you can do in your life. Yeah. Get into action. Yeah. You can volunteer. There's a million things you can do. We don't just do convention estates. Uh, we're involved in pro-life stuff, pro-Second Amendment stuff, property tax reform, faith initiatives, there's all kinds of stuff. If you want to be involved in a community of like-minded people, but the key is you got to be somebody who wants to do something. Well, and it's interesting too, and I'm going to connect it to Christianity again too, as we wrap up. If you go, if you, when you attend church, the idea of church is not to sit in the pews and watch the band entertain you and the pastor give a good speech or, you know, a good sermon or not, which is how a lot of us go to yeah. church. It's to get involved. And I do think it's interesting that our founders who were deists and, and Christians it was a participatory yeah. government. And I, I think we just got on auto, autopilot. And what you're saying, it's just like church. You, you actually have to do something. Do you, you know what I mean? Like we all have to do something. Oh, you got to get involved. I, I love what you're saying because, and that's what you're saying is go to the website and, and what's the, the dot Conventionofstates.com. Yeah, and sign up because the founders did not leave us a government in which you can go on autopilot. In fact, it's actually so well designed that it's gone on autopilot. Yes. But if we don't go back and grab the controls from time to time, right? And not just the people up in Washington, but the, the person down on the ground and local yeah, and that's really the most important. That's person. the most important, and we'll lose the country. Agreed. And, but the controls are there, and we can't get so down about what happened in, in the in elections or what we might think. You know, you know what? Fraud happens. It probably did happen. Yep. And it's probably going to happen again. So what are you going to do? Are you going to just sit there and bail out, or are you going to get involved? And well, so, I know you're not. I'm not. Yeah, no, you're making me, you're making me feel more optimistic, I think, after this conversation because I— I think I, I have a little, a little black pill in Brett sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I think all of us go there sometimes. Yeah. So the key is to be surrounded by people who won't let you stay there very long. Yeah, that's great. Mark Meckler, man, this has been such a great conversation. Is it, so anything else where people can follow you, uh, whether it's on Twitter or where, where should people go? I mean, really, so I do a little bit of tweeting, but I, Twitter to me is- You're a little quiet on Twitter. Toxic. <laughs> uh, um, MarkMeckler.com is where kind of the more intimate stuff is. Yeah. And uh, that's pictures of the dogs. And I do political stuff there too, but they'll see my views on everything at MarkMeckler.com. And I, I want to just say, like, I, I'm super impressed with you. And like, one of the things that uh, I uh, love about you is that you, you, you do seem so authentic. And I love that you're not in the tank really for- Either party, even in a way, <laughs> way, which I, I know that may not be perceived. Obviously, you and I are both con conservative. Yeah, I'm conservative both Christian. Christian guy. The Republican Party is the lever we'll pull because yeah. it's the lever we got. Right. But I love that you're actually, I, I'm where you're at. It's like, you know what? I'm holding my nose. <laughs> and like, I think that's good in a way because it's sort of, I don't know, it, we're, there's an unbiased feeling about you at this point that you just want to do the right thing. <laughs> nice hey, to so see you, nice Mark. Nice to see you too. <laughs> what a surprise. Yeah. How you doing? There you are. <laughs> How you doing? Sorry, Brett. I uh, I get into a. I have this terrible habit of falling into Joe Biden. I know. I want to see. I, well, I want to actually. See, I haven't seen the uh, that movie. Is it my? Why? Signature? I know. I need to see that. Why? People will pay twenty one dollars for a let uh, make America great again hat, but they won't watch a real picture about the truth. Because we're afraid we might see you with I don't know who in bed. Well, right? no, I'm not in bed. I can tell you that. I'm too old. Have you seen it? I have not. I heard it's great. It's on my list. It's a fantastic sure. movie. You can buy the DVD now. Um, I just checked this morning. I check every day. Yeah, actually. yeah. On Rotten Tomatoes, we have a 90% uh, audience liking and a 60% on the uh, reviews. That's higher than I would expect. By the well, case. the reviewers would have been higher, except um, Rolling Stone reviewed it and didn't watch the movie. <laughs> Shocking. <laughs> the truth, uh, you know. But it's a great, great. And it's done. I mean, like it's financially done really well. My well, opinion. it was it was a not for profit. Uh, okay. And Fella McClear, uh, Fella McClear, and, and McLehen, McLehenny. It was Breitbart. <clears throat> well, they distributed it, okay. but um, 
Ann and, um, and Phelan produced their first picture called Frack Nation, okay. which is a terrific documentary. I know Ann and Phelan literally from my first Tea Party event in Sacramento. Thank you. Great they people. Wonderful. Then they made the film Gosnell. And uh, yep. you were talking earlier about uh, how Christ works with you. And uh, I'm a very hand. I have been for, I've been in yeah. show business for yeah. 43 years. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> my life was always boom, 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 and call, call, quack, 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 quack. And, you know, I was canceled. I know that. I mean, so you, you were. Oh, do you have two hours? Uh, well, I would love <laughs> to hear a version of when that. When did that happen? Well, I, I it, happened, it, it happened the uh, first season of Dynasty. I was uh, called by the producer, and they said, um, well, this is, I wasn't canceled then, but I'll tell you how I was canceled. But <laughs> the producer called and said, we're going to a Jerry Brown's, uh, uh, to the Biltmore Hotel in Los Angeles. Jerry Brown's uh, election night for the governor. Yeah, yeah. I said, mm. <laughs> uh, I don't know about that. Uh, she said, well, you know, uh, things would be a little easier for you on Dynasty if you went. That was the first. And I thought, oh, boy. And I just came to Hollywood. You're like a very rare Many thing. years later, in Hollywood. I'm now on the Colby's, yeah. working with Charlton Heston. Yeah. And this is what it was like in the 80s. And the gentleman tapped me on the back. And I turned around, a distinguished, slim, beautiful blue suit. And he said, hello, I'm A.C. Lyles. I hear you're a Republican. <laughs> it's like being a Marxist back in 1950. <laughs> I said, what? I said, yes. So we're standing there. He said, I was Ronald Reagan's best man. I said, really? He said, how'd you like to meet the president? Smash cut years later after going to the White House to a number of state dinners. And uh, I was at the convention in New Orleans for George Bush Sr. And I'm sitting there in the, <coughs> in the uh, dome. And there's Muhammad Ali and Frank Sinatra. And suddenly somebody taps me on the shoulder and says, come on, come with me. Go sit next to Barbara Bush. And I thought, oh, wow. And this is the night he's accepting. <laughs> yeah. All right. And I sat down, I introduced myself, and I look up, and here's my picture with Barbara Bush oh, on a jumbotron. <laughs> <laughs> now you're on a say. national feed. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, done. there goes my career. And that's that. And so even, so that, how long ago was this then? Oh, well, this was uh, uh, 1990, right? Because it's yeah, interesting, because we think of cancel culture as being a recent phenomenon. You're, you're oh. saying it started way long time ago. Okay. Um, Barbara Stanwyck, set of Colby's. She told me, you know what they did? She was married to Robert Taylor. Okay. okay an actor. You know okay. Robert Taylor. He flew B-17s over Germany. Decorated war hero. And there was a bronze statue in front of the Irving Thalberg, the writer's building at MGM. Yeah. Honoring him. And Barbara pulls, you know, pulls me in, and we're, we're sitting there talk, talking. And uh, she said, you know those bastards just tore my husband's bronze statue down and took it away? That was back in 1985. That's incredible. So <clears throat> it's been a battle. It's been a battle. But lately, I think the whole cancel culture, I think, has just evolved within the last, where it's exposed. Yeah, right. I would say five, maybe seven, eight years. That's it. I mean, I just got to <laughs> So you, but back then, I mean, I, I kind of knew this. I mean, I was in the advertising industry. I was at the top of that. I was in the, the chief creative officer of the biggest agency on the West Coast. And yeah, I didn't talk about my politics almost no. ever. Somebody point blank asked me. I might tell them. I noticed they would do this. That was pre-COVID mask. They had to put on a mask if they could. But even then, you know, you could talk about it. And it, there wasn't this. I call, you know what I call people in Hollywood? 90% of them are posers. They yeah. pose. Yeah, right. Yeah. There's only about a handful of them that actually maybe are pulling strings. Mm -hmm. I had friends of mine, you know, on their Instagram, BLM when it came out. Yeah, you no, know, with a link to the BLM page. <laughs> Suddenly that's disappeared. Right. Yeah. But they pose. Right. And the funny thing is about show business, it's one of the hardest businesses there is. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. It's business. It's cutthroat. And I'll cut you out if I can get a dollar more than right. you. And that's funny, because in a community yeah. that you would imagine as being multicultural, inclusive, and this and that, and no. Yeah, it's, it's all this. What can I get? How much can I make? And I can guarantee you, if they had to give up those big, expensive homes and those big, expensive cars, they would stop posing. They go with the flow.
And that flow could change right. like this. Yeah, and they'll take another side in two seconds. <clears throat> is it, so do you think it's healthier that it's out in the open now as opposed to more behind the scenes? Yeah, yeah, we're talking about it. I really Look, like that. Yeah, We're talking about it. You and I, the three of us are talking about right. it, okay? More discussion. Um, when I made My Son Hunter, I got a call from Phelan. And he said, I want you to play Joe Biden. This was in the fall of 21. I'm just trying to imagine how I would feel. Oh, You're like, I'm not sure this about, about a, all that. This is Friday afternoon. I'm at Kroger's <laughs> yeah. with a shopping cart. And I said, Phelan, what? He said, yes, I want you to play Joe Biden in a picture called My Son Hunter. I said, okay, let me read the script and I'll yeah, call you yeah. on Monday. Right. I read the script. I called him Sunday afternoon. I said, this is the best script I've ever read. This is fantastic. I got to say Fantastic. This now. Yeah, now, it's based, everything, everything we do in the picture is either based on actual emails or fact. Okay? Yeah. All right? It's, it's not. It's all becoming so obviously well, fact. Well, wait. <laughs> and when we were making yeah. this, there was no laptop. Yeah, that's you right. maniac. <laughs> my, you stupid conservative fool. What are you doing? There's no. It's all a conspiracy. There's nothing. What's wrong with you? Over there in Belgrade, Serbia, <laughs> making this conservative whack job picture. Yeah. But Lawrence Fox, who started the uh, Reclaim Party, right? You, right? Which yep. is very similar in yep. many ways to the Tea Party. Yeah. <clears throat> he ran for mayor. He was canceled. Canceled on a talk show. Essentially because a lady asked him uh, about rape, and he said, well, you know, rape is a big word. You shouldn't just go around calling right. someone a rapist, at which point he was canceled. That's, oh, you can't say that. Gina Corona, who was... Yeah, oh, yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, um, uh, Valador, uh, whatever that... Yeah, Star Trek or Matt movie. Mandalorian. She's in it. She was canceled, of course. Uh, Robert Dobby, a great guy. Yeah. Great director. Goonies. Goonies. Yeah, that's right. Uh, James great Bond, and one of yeah. the best Bond. He directed it, and... Uh, he was fantastic. And you know, there is nudity. Not, no, there is not nudity, but there is sex in it, of course, with Hunter Biden. Yeah, you're trying to portray that. Uh, but uh, we had a five-star review from the, the biggest Christian review and website. I forget the name of it. Yeah. They gave us five stars. Wow. So it's a good picture. Well, I really want to see it. Yeah, and what you said, I want to back up just for a second to what sure. you said, is like we're talking about it now. This, this right. thing where we're like not allowed to be... Uh, conservatives, let's say, forget the Republican word. I don't even know if I like that word anymore, but Christian or conservative in Hollywood or in the advertising industry. And it actually made me think that like a little bit of what we were talking about, did we make our own bed in this a little bit as Christians, as conservatives in that we wanted to get along? Yeah. So what did we do? We just zipped our mouth. Yep. We allowed it to happen. Conservatives are boring. They're uncreative. Yep. Okay. We don't walk around with pink hair. And right. <laughs> I mean, look at me. We're I mean, boring. <laughs> we have no creativity. Right. And the funny thing is, Epic Times, I think, gave us a review. They said this could be the pinnacle, the beginning of real good conservative oh, pictures. Now, yes, you're, I was going to comment on that before you mentioned it. We allowed it to happen. We... You, <laughs> Oh, you, God, you're a conservative. God, Penny Lowe. And then you go quiet. Button down, right. button down Oxford shirt. And, oh, jeez, what a bore you must be. Yeah. That's not the case. Right. Not the case at all. No, I agree. I, I, I think... Uh, and being in advertising, you should know how they do it. No, I know. And I think, like, like you said, a lot, there's a lot of people with conservative instincts in Hollywood. They're just not going to talk about it. Right. And they, and they are those people. But I also mean that at least this is, maybe I'm projecting my own self. I, I want to get along with my office mate or my coworkers. And so when they say something highly offensive <laughs> to me, you know, partly because I'm a free speech guy, like, like I'm sure you guys are, I just let it go off my, you know, off my back. But, but in a way, you're teaching someone that, that's okay. that, they can, that you have no boundaries. Right. You know, and, they, and so for, just in defense of the left a little bit, I didn't even know I was offending you because you never said anything. So I called you a Bible thumper or whatever I called you, and you didn't say anything. And so there's a little bit of like, you owe people boundaries, a little bit, or they will step on them. You know what I mean? I don't know. I, you know, yeah. I, I don't know why things have changed. I mean, why today do we have to watch what we say and do it? <laughs> you don't like what I say, there's the door. Yeah. You know, John Forsythe said something to me that's very interesting. I don't know if I, I agree with it to a certain extent. Yeah. 
And we were in the makeup room, and um, he said, you know, I don't know. I think it was when I was going to the yeah. White House. And he was saying, you know, John, let me tell you something. If you want to be an actor, you be an actor. If you want to be a politician, be a politician. Mm -hmm. Leave politics out of an actor's life. Because Best advice. When you go to that theater and it's <clears> sold out, you want every one of those people to love you. I don't care how middle of the road you are. Can't we just reach across the aisle? No, that's politics. You can't. Nobody agrees on anything. Yeah. And I don't understand I why today entertainers, actors, producers, directors have to get on their stump and project and preach. No, I want to be entertained. I know. And that's the problem. Go woke, go broke, and I'm telling you, these companies are going to feel the heat because they're not doing their business. It's show business. Today it's all business and all woke. Yeah. And people are not going to, they're not going to right. pay the bills. By the way, you know <clears throat> who I think read the room better than anybody this summer? It's Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise. I, I showed up in that theater to watch Top Gun Maverick, and I, I, I haven't seen that in, since I was a child. First of all, we're coming out of COVID, so nobody's in a theater. Right. Suddenly I'm in a theater filled with people and at the end of that film, it's spontaneous applause. Yeah. And I went, and you know what Tom did too? He like put a diverse cast up there. He didn't make a big deal of it. It was just like, if you're a pilot in that Top Gun program, it's because you're good. And, so, and it was so, I actually shot with Joseph Kaczynski, the, the director, uh, shot a Taco Bell spot with him. He's brilliant, like excellent director. I remember sitting with him on the couch before, when he got the job, I said, I think America needs that movie. This is before right. George Floyd. This is before COVID. And he looked at me, he goes, I think you're right. Um, but I just, I really give those two guys kudos. And they probably won't even want me to give them kudos <laughs> because of the way Hollywood is right now. But for reading the room, like Tom Cruise got it. I'm here to, he's an entertainer. I'm not really interested. I mean, he did touch into Scientology and some things in the past, but... He really um, just made a great movie, and I, I think that's what you're saying is, is like, can we get back to that? Did you see the appetite for that? It was a billion and a half bucks for a movie? It's pretty simple. It's a pretty simple, I mean, they call it the flyover states. Well, those flyover states compromise 90%, 95% right. of our population. They want to be entertained. Yeah. They want, they, you know, that's, I worked for Aaron Spelling, all right, one of the Probably, oh, yeah. I think, the biggest sure. producer in television. We used to call it Aaron's Broadcast Company. <laughs> <laughs> yep. He had nine shows on Yeah, it. incredible. Yeah. All right. I don't think now, anybody else ever did. were they art? Was Dynasty art? No, but Dynasty had 59 million people yeah. view one night on our, one of our um, uh, cliffhangers at the end of our season. We were canceled with 29 million. Right. But the point is, is that Aaron was a showman. People who work nine to five get in the car, they'd come home from the job, they want to sit back, they don't want to think. They want to just be entertained, right. eat their popcorn, have their TV dinner, and go to bed. Yeah. And that's the trick. We've yeah. gotten away from that. I also yeah. think conservatives have a tendency nowadays, especially conservative Christians, to make Christian films, not all of them, but most of them that are preaching to the choir and are pretty low quality. Yeah. And the idea is the preaching first and the art or the entertainment second. And so they're not making good product. And instead of saying, look, I'm gonna make good product, it, maybe it carries our values, carries a good message with it, but the product, the entertainment value, the art value has to come first. Yeah, I think you're right. And, and then if you, you weave the good conservative values in it, I think you get a home run. Yeah. And by the way, I think they want me to play the trailer. I think Ooh. we're going to play it. But I wanted to say one thing about that before I lose that thought is that historically, Christians made the best art in the world. You look at Europe and you're like, oh, the, the cathedrals <laughs> and the Michelangelo. I mean, you go to the Sistine Chapel and you're just, it's right. like you melt when you look up at it. And it's like, what happened to that? <laughs> And that's why do they do that? Well, they're inspired by the creator to Absolutely. make the greatest expressions of creativity in history, and we've forgotten that. I'm we've a become student of, of the 40s, golden era of Hollywood. Just about every picture had a moral yes. aspect to it back then. It wasn't pounded in. Right, but it was but you walked away, out. and there was something about good is good. Yes. Virtually all. Yeah. Yeah. So do, is that right? Are we going to play the trailer? Yes. Let's see it. Let's uh oh. Check this out. So I'll tell you what's going down. Do you know who I am? 
They told me you were VIP. Well connected to the government. What kind of a moron forgets to pick up his laptop at a repair shop? You're a Biden. Act like one. Everything he built, life, I just ruined it all. I want to know everything that's on that laptop that can ruin my erection. My friends, it's time to party! I'm an artist. Tell me how I can help you. Well, I don't deserve help. Oh, I'm so sorry. I've been through worse. You're the smartest man I know. Thanks, Dad. I just wish I could smack some sense to you. I'll never forget Corey Pop. He was a bad dude. No joke. Dad, we were talking about suffering. <laughs> wow. I know. So, yeah. So, you were, you, I was going to say, I thought when they, Michael said that he was going to surprise me with you uh, at some point, but he didn't say what you would do. But I thought you were going to come out. I'm and not be, sure. It and, yeah. <laughs> I, I love what you're doing. It's great. But I thought you were going to come out and, and be Joe Biden. So, you played Joe Biden. And, and I, I'm, now I'm very, very curious to watch you that. Gotta, uh, here's an interesting story. I'm there a week, and I'm um, down in the lobby studying my line. That scene in the car, by the way, was about 17 pages of two-handed with uh, Lawrence. Wonderful guy. Can't wait to see him again. Studying my script. Two guys walk up to me. Hey, you're John James. You're playing Joe Biden. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, we're, we're documentary filmmakers. We're here to make a film about uh, Hunter. So we're going off to uh, Russia, wherever else, Kiev, they were going to. So we sat down and started talking, telling Hollywood war stories. And another fellow walks up who looked like Mick Jagger and joins them. He was the head producer. So we're talking along, and all of a sudden, ding dong. You know, I was expecting you guys to be here about three or four days ago. Meaning, these guys aren't documentary filmmakers. Who the hell are these guys? He said, no, 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 <laughs> that's funny. No, we're making a film. So we go to the elevator. The taller Mick Jagger looking guy, I said, oh man, this jet lag's terrible, and you coming from LA, I'm just coming from Nashville. I said, what airline did you take? He said, um, uh, my Falcon 5. Well, a Falcon 5 is the most expensive private jet. So I had my born identity moment. So that was the FBI jet. <laughs> I get in the car, I go down and see Felham on location. I said, there's these three scary <clears throat> guys. He meets with him. Turns out he's the attorney for Park Place and made the deal for Paramount for $900 million for the producers of Park Place. Lo and behold, three months ago, that gentleman was Hunter Biden's attorney who paid off his tax lien to the IRS. The that's Mick the guy that's on the set. Mick Jagger lookalike. Wow. That is crazy. I mean... And at the time, when we're making this picture, everybody's saying, what are you doing? There's nothing. So it was a very, very, it was like we were this it's little, like real life intrudes little group of renegades. And I said, you know, I'm so conservative. I mean, I grew up in New Canaan, Connecticut, the most conservative place in the country, right? <laughs> you know, stiff, you know, upper lip, and everybody goes to Ivy League school. <laughs> I mean, conservative. Yeah. And I feel like a radical. I'm a hippie. Well, that, and we are these. <laughs> I am a hippie, man. Yeah. I'm counterculture. Well, you're making a good point because I'm I, 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 I hate this. This That's is our counterculture, I and, I, and there's something We're weird about that. I mean, we are, we are just way, way out there. Well, totally. I, and then I, then I, someday, one day, it hit me. I'm like. And the founders were counterculture. Yes, they were radical. <laughs> I mean, you look at them, a bunch of long hair, like, you know, like there's something in the DNA of this country that it, we keep returning to that. Look, I'm 66 years old, about to be 67. When I was growing up back in the, and you might remember this, Mark, there was a saying, question authority. Absolutely. The yippies and the hippies and the dippies and the whippies. <laughs> question authority. What That's the hell's awesome. the matter with these people? They don't question anything right. they just yeah. are zombies yes yeah well and we're the ones questioning authority and we're called conspiracy nuts whack jobs crazies making right. these silly films that have are, mean nothing yeah come on it's all coming out now it will be in next, this coming week right this tomorrow now uh, we're gonna get a lot more of it yeah well, this has been fun, man. You surprised yeah. us like this, and uh, you now I want to see this movie quite badly. It actually, like the quality. Just go of it. to uh, my son Hunter. Just 
My Son Hunter. Just okay. Google it. You can buy a DVD for twenty. I'm going to watch that like this yeah. like this weekend. It's I want to see here. that. But yeah, it looks it looks fantastic. It looks like the craft is there, like we've been talking about, which great. is what what I'm really impressed with too, just from a little bit of what that I saw there. But I want to see you <laughs> as Joe Biden. Oh dear, it's so awesome. We'll have a Mark. whole different flavor now. Great to have you today. Thank <laughs> you for having having coming on and doing this. So fun. Yeah, really enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thanks for joining The Big Picture. I hope you enjoyed this episode. You made it to the end, so just hit the subscribe button or the like button. I don't care which. Actually, I'd like you to subscribe. And follow me on Twitter. Follow me on LinkedIn. Uh, you'll see that I'm constantly posting things, usually getting the conversation going, which I would love if you joined it. So please join in to the conversation and follow. Thanks for joining me today.